Carl Jung predicted the arrival of artificial intelligence 70 years before it happened. And he made this prediction in a book that Jordan Peterson said is the most terrifying book that he had ever read, named Ion. And this book is named Ion because Ion means era. And it is a study in the transition from one era to another. One of the best examples of this would be the transition from the old pagan world of the ancient Greeks and the Romans where might was right into the new moral world of the Christian era. And that transition completely flipped the world in its head. All of the old pagan myths were washed away and a new spiritual paradigm was introduced. If you were a Roman pagan living back then, you would have probably felt like it was the end of time itself. All of your traditions crumbling in your hands and all these new people swooping into your empire, taking it over and transforming it into their vision and their dreams. And if you've been attentive in the last couple of years, you will notice that something like this is happening again. Many Western people feel like these ancient Romans, where their traditions, their culture, their identity, their civilization seems like it's getting washed away to make room for something new. It seems like the Western world is imploding under its own madness, falling into a death spiral. Some even say that we have reached the end of history itself. The Industrial Revolution has led to us reaching a new civilizational paradigm that has never before been seen in history. Technology has transformed the entire nature of the world forever, and we are now in a new era. And so we need to reset our moral values and our comprehension of how society works in order for us to adapt to these new times. And a critical part of this modern transition into a new era is about a promise of a savior coming through the form of technology, the rising of artificially made intelligence, this pivot moment in our history where we all of a sudden become like gods. We create life and it is so intelligent that it turns into a god. This new era, this new transition point is saturated in religious motifs. And it was this that Carl Jung focused on that allowed him to make this prediction about what could be coming around the corner. He was a psychologist and a symbolist in his heart. And so he was able to look at all these motifs in early Christianity and realize that there was a huge outpouring of new symbols showing up now that were making promises to our souls about what the future might hold. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus on three major symbolic motifs that Carl Jung pointed out in his book, Ion, that allowed him to predict the coming of artificial intelligence 70 years before it was a reality. Our first motif is what I am going to call the arrival of year zero. If you pay attention to our calendar, you'll notice that it stretches all the way back for 2000 years to Christ's ministry upon earth. Christ is the foundation stone of our entire mental paradigm. The space time continuum is rooted in the moment when he walked upon this world. Jesus Christ stands at the crucible of time itself. He is year zero. Before him, the world was lost. We were all Nietzschean pagans charging around in a state of nature, convinced that might is right, refusing to put on clothes and clean up after ourselves, humans sacrificing everybody who vexed us. And we had a nasty habit of idealizing those who were muscular and strong. We were very shallow. We would look at the bodybuilding types like Hercules or Achilles, and we would raise statues of them and mire their physiques as they mugged the world. And of course, the great innovation of Christianity was to annihilate that shallowness by showing us what type of evil this bodybuilder, this man of strength commits in the world. Christ upon the cross became a terrible confrontation for us pagans. We were forced to look at the consequences of our actions. We were forced to see the opposite of the man of power up upon the statues and instead look at the victim, the body that was destroyed by strength, the body that was tortured, the slave that we beat to death and killed. And the psychological consequence of this was that it woke us up. It was a great moment of us becoming aware of our moral responsibility. Before we were pagans and we were free, we could seek 
strength, and victory. But after Christ, we were always forced to consider those that we damage and hurt. After Christ, we always had a voice in the back of our heads that made us feel guilty. In what way am I causing more pain and trauma in this world by expressing those instincts within me? Christ was year zero for the moral age of mankind, the age of Christianity where man was forced to wrestle with his conscience, wrestle with the higher questions of life. What does it mean to be good, to be moral, to be above the savage instincts of nature? How do we escape the old paradigm of Achilles and the Romans, where they were running around like Martian soldiers, reading Nietzsche all the time, acting like crazy bastards? Nietzsche himself said that this moment was a moment when there was a re-evaluation of morality that transforms the history of the world. After this year zero, the instinctive and uncontrollable realm of nature was cast out the window. The naked statues in the cities were torn down. The Olympics were banned. The bathhouses were closed. The old pagan temples were torn into ruin. The writings of the pagans were burned in the streets. A new world was born and the old world was washed away in the sands of time. Now, if you study our era, you will see that there's a year zero just like this rising inside of our imaginations. Many people talk about the singularity. They say there's a point coming in history where nothing will ever be the same. Things will be transformed forever. There is an event horizon that we cannot see beyond because things will get too crazy. And we are in the blast fragment of this. We're coming up to this. This will be the moment where artificial intelligence welcomes itself into the world like Skynet, and it becomes fully generalized and conscious, and accelerates the progress of mankind so fast that we literally have a moment Moment where things end. Now, this prophecy about the arrival of Year Zero Part Two is quite compelling by itself, but there's even more to it. You see, the prophecy of the singularity is littered with religious symbolism. In fact, it almost seems like a version of Christianity. It contains within it many of the same hopes. For example, St. Paul said that those who believe will have their spiritual bodies resurrected at the end of time. Their souls will be saved. Now think about this in relationship to this promise of the singularity. What do you always hear from these tech guys? Don't they say that we're going to all plug Neuralink into the back of our head and then our consciousness, which is some type of separate phenomenon, some type of electricity running around inside of our nervous system, that consciousness will be extracted through the Neuralink and brought into a USB file. And then we'll be able to plug that USB file into any machine, perhaps one of these new robots of some sort. And we'll be able to remove Move our minds out of our bodies, which are perishable, which can die, and we'll be able to install them into new technological tools. We could put them into a new body and walk around as some type of robot boyo taking over the world. What are you going to do then when I'm made of metal and I'm coming after you? How is that going to work? Or you could plug this USB stick into some type of giant group brain. Maybe you'd plug it straight into Twitter or something like that. That might be the plan. And at the very end of time, all of us will find ourselves plugging our consciousness into this collective group mind, this giant Borg, this Death Star containing all the consciousness of the world. You see, the promise is that we all suffer because we are separated from each other by the tragedy of our biological bodies, by our individuality. But we will create a giant machine, a giant cybernetic system that will take all of our consciousness together. It will be heaven manifested and created in reality. And we will be able to upload our consciousness into this and live together as one. Oh yes, this is the rapture. This is Paul's promise of our souls escaping our body and living forever. The Christian end of times promise that a new kingdom will come and there will be a new earth reborn in alignment with God's laws that will be beautiful, that will be perfect. Well, this is exactly what we are hearing here. We will escape this old world, this fallen world, and these bodies that come from this fallen world. We will defeat them. 
we will escape them and we will join each other in consciousness because consciousness and our souls and our spiritual consciousness this is what is real about us this is what is pure all of this materialistic fallen matter and flesh that we are imprisoned in this is evil this is the source of division and pain and arrogance and selfishness we must overcome this pagan realm and in this new technological kingdom of heaven here we will find eternal life here the promises of religion will be fulfilled here we will have god as kurtzwell said we will create him we will create an all-powerful super intelligence that gathers up big data on all of us and uses algorithmic powers to be more intelligent than all of us put together and it will be our leader it will be the consciousness that guides this entire borg we will supply it with our souls so that it can direct us and we will be in union with it and all together as one we will be this new organism and this new entity shuttling through space taking over the whole galaxy to bring peace and love in 1960s rock music and so it's clear to see that there is some sort of psychological architecture in place that's bringing us towards a new year zero and Jung's explanation for why this is is quite scary you see all new ages have to go in rebellion against their old age in order for them to have psychological validity they have to demonize the past you saw with the rise of Christianity, the presentation of the Christians, that they are the paragons of morality, the paragons of righteousness. They are the ones who are conscious, aware of the struggles of the victims. And those old pagans from the older world, it's not like they were more nuanced than these Christians make them out to be. No, of course not. Instead, these pagans were just demons running around, complete monsters, completely unconscious, rabid and foaming at the mouth. And of course you can understand why. After thousands of years of human civilization with this ethos of might is right, with these Nietzschean Romans and these Greek monsters running around, perhaps people got a little bit tired of this. They felt that we wanted to civilize and move forward into a moral paradigm. And so they had to demonize this past. This is what gave Christianity such powerful psychological validity. But here's the kicker. After going through the last 2000 years of being Christian, we've basically burned ourselves out. We've gotten sick of religiousness. We've gotten sick of the promises of the afterlife, the promises of spirituality, the promises of Christianity. We've sat here for 2000 years and waited for the end of times and the salvation and the ascendancy of man. We've waited for the kingdom of heaven. We've sat there and listened to these priests in their pulpits promise us that in another life things will be better and all this suffering and pain is justified. Over the centuries we have gotten tired of this. We have all become Christopher Hitchens. The psychological validity of the Christian paradigm has burned itself out over 2000 years. And so now we are manifesting its opposite. We are motivated by many of the same hopes. We still hope for salvation, but we want to do it not in this fanciful spiritual way. We want to go into matter, go into the material world. We want to go down into our reality and we want to seize stones and silicon and reshape it into a heaven on earth that we can actually make the promises come true. After all these centuries, our will has shifted gear. We are no longer satisfied with the pontifications of priests. We find spiritual blathering, theology, discussions about how many angels sit on a pinhead as a waste of time, as not leading us towards any solutions, as lost in the heady platonic world of heaven and ideas. Instead, our will is materialistic. We are anti-spiritual. We are anti-Christian. We are the fallen angels who plan to build our utopia because God cast us out of the kingdom of heaven. Now this may sound extreme, but you will notice if you look around that there is an enormous anti-Christian sentiment that saturates all parts of our culture and has saturated it for hundreds of years at this point. Ever since the Enlightenment, there's been an explosion of an anti-Christian sentiment. The rise of science humiliated the church in many ways and has pushed it out of the realm of seriousness. This is what I'm getting at. The will pushing us towards artificial 
intelligence, towards this new year zero, towards this singularity at the end of time, is fully anti-Christian. For the last 500 years, we've seen out of our art arise the romanticization of Satan. You see this in Paradise Lost. You see William Blake explore this. You see Nietzsche write books called The Antichrist. You see now the inversion of Western culture and the pushing out of Christianity, the humiliation of Christianity, the slandering of Christianity. And this sets the stage for this huge idea that Jung is talking about. As we come to the close of a 2000 year historical process, as we come to a new year zero, we will go to war against our past. And this means going to war with Christianity, going to war with spirituality, going to war with a doctrine that said we had a soul and instead embracing a materialistic and mechanistic way of thinking. And that could be very dangerous. Stalin's communist regime in the 20th century said that one person dying is a tragedy, but a million people dying is a statistic. And this precise style of thinking is what's going to begin to ominously float over our year zero when it becomes the rise of the machines out of mankind. Now the next motif is the Philosopher's Stone. We're gonna get alchemical in here. Because you see, Jung was not afraid of going into the weird and the wonderful side of mankind. You see, alchemy was the progenitor of science. It was the dreamlike substructure that our enlightenment thinking was born out of. And Jung knew that it was important to study these things because they reveal to us the original and purest intentions of these enormous movements. Now, how do we make sense of this? Well, let's go back to the Bible. We had year zero, we had Christ, and we had this enormous transformative moment. The Nietzschean reevaluation of all values took place in this moment. Now, Christ did not just pop up out of nowhere. In fact, for hundreds of years leading up to the moment of Christianity, Judaism had prophets and had many people declaring a mimetic substructure, a dream vision that would set the foundation for Christ. In fact, what made Christ so compelling to people is that the story of his life fulfills so many prophecies. In Isaiah, you have a passage, one of the Jewish prophets, who says the, that God will come down and he'll walk among us and we will scorn him. We will treat him like a useless weed on the side of the road. He will be stricken. He will be mocked. He will be a man of sorrows, familiar with pain and suffering, and we will turn our hand away from him. He will be unbecoming to us. And of course, this is exactly how Christ lived his life. He was spat on by the Pharisees. He was denied by his own apostles. The Romans sort of said casually, oh, whatever with this idiot, Jesus Christ, these Jews are crazy, just do whatever they want. He was spat away, thrown away. The ultimate vision of divinity, the highest possible power and goodness in the world is treated like this by mankind. How terrible, how much of an exposure of man's dirty, filthy nature that we must learn to take care of. And the premises for Christ's mission were set up in these earlier prophecies. So for hundreds of years before year zero, there were dreams pouring out of these people and it was all fulfilled in this one man. And the exact same thing is happening to us for 500 years since the Renaissance, maybe even before that, there has been the eruption of these dreams coming out of the European people. Even 500 years ago, you were beginning to see some of these sentiments that we were talking about in our first motif, the desire for materialism, the impatience towards the church. Imagine a wealthy man in Venice all those years ago. Let's say his father was a very successful tradesman in the Mediterranean Sea. He had brought him much wealth and freed his son to explore intellectual pursuits. This young son, he would walk around Venice and he would see the compelling power of the church. He would see all the babies are baptized by these priests and he would hear them pontificate about this afterlife. And something inside of him would say to himself, they don't ever fulfill their promises, do they? They don't really achieve everlasting life or immortality. I'm a bit suspicious of this. But of course, he can't go and talk about it publicly like people do nowadays. Instead, he has to keep these thoughts very privately to himself. So he would be like your dad. He would go out into the garage out back and he would tinker around with a car wheel or some type of model airplane or something like this. Only this gentleman would do it with a private study. 
he would go and create a lab in his rich aristocratic house. And there were many men around Europe that were doing this. And the focus for a lot of these guys was built on this idea of materialism. They wanted to take this approach that God created this world. And if they can dive into the world with their reason, with their logic, and shear apart the world and understand the constitute parts that make up reality. And this knowledge of God's world, this submission and discipline to study God's reality would actually unlock the powers of God's reality. And this is how they would achieve things like immortality and eternal life. This is what they began to understand is that this is all here for a reason. This is a puzzle, this world in front of us, this world of matter. This is a puzzle that we must figure out. And this is how we transform ourselves. This is how we overcome the problems that religious people promise to us. This is how we overcome death. We overcome sickness. We overcome weakness. All by knowledge that we find ourselves empowered. And you should be able to see in that the foundations of the psychology of the European man of science. This is a very unique character throughout history. You rarely see a culture with so many people dedicated towards this materialism, this desire to shear apart the material world and understand its constitute functions. But this is what began to get born 500 years ago during the Renaissance. Now, when these gentlemen would do this in their private studies, it was very crude. They didn't really know what they were doing. They didn't have the system of science that we've built up because these guys were creating it. So they were doing some wacky stuff. You'll often hear that the alchemists were trying to figure out a way to turn lead into gold. Now, one of Jung's brilliant observations is that this was as much a psychological motivation as a realistic project. These guys were trying to wrestle with a really big idea here that is not quite obvious to us on first glance. Their souls were like the soul of an artist. An artist looks at stone and feels the desire to transform that stone into a beautiful statue or a beautiful building. And so they felt deep down that there was a logic in the world that they only needed to understand that would allow them to transform pretty much anything that is ugly into something that is beautiful. And you can see how this style of thinking laid the premises for something like nuclear fission. This desire to penetrate into the depths of matter and understand the chemical processes that cause matter to transform and to change. This leads to the foundations of physics and chemistry. And over the next 400 years, brings Western man to the point where he creates a super weapon that's able to unlock the incredible power out of matter. And he can use it as a weapon to destroy the world or use it as a power generator to bring the world to a state of abundance. And so you can see through this Jungian lens, the psychological and symbolic meaning of turning lead into gold. It is a psychological motivation to create value, to transform the world, to gain power, to take what is ugly and make it beautiful. This is the process of life. What separates life from death is the fact that life is anti-entropic. Do you know that matter is entropic? Time destroys it. It makes stones crumble. But life is beyond that. Life is magical. Life is able to resist the forces of time while it is alive. This is what the alchemists were seeking. And they have another symbol that explores these same things that has this deep psychological motivation. And this is the Philosopher's Stone. And the Philosopher's Stone was concerned with everlasting life, with achieving immortality. Because as we said, these Venetian aristocrats walking around Venice would have been jaded with their priests pontificating about some afterlife. They would want salvation in this world. They would want to learn the secrets of this reality and achieve real immortality. They would have been like these longevity bros, like Brian Johnson, trying to figure out how they can transform their bodies into an ever-living machine to overcome mitochondrial disease and extend their lifespans for hundreds of years. They had that will inside of them to defeat death itself. Death should not be something that you need a promise to deal with in their minds. They want something that actually defeats it. There must be a logic to physiology to our bodies, to matter, which is what our bodies are, that we can unlock, that will give us the ability to overcome death. This is the thinking that was going on inside of these guys, and you see it all the time now. You might say to yourself, Steph, 
the hell does this have to do with a stone? Well, you see, this is the magic and beauty of the symbol of the Philosopher's Stone that showed up in these alchemical scripts and this alchemical structure. The Philosopher's Stone is a paradox. It is a living stone, a union of these two opposite forces. A rock, which is dead, which is nothing going for it, which is a bit of a lazy lump that just sits down there on the floor. And a heart, and blood, and flesh. Both of these things are matter, but flesh and blood is alive. It grows, it moves. You rip open somebody's chest and blood squirts out. Blood is the life substance that gives us power. And the Philosopher's Stone was theorized, was symbolically imagined, to be a stone that you crack open that had flesh inside of it, that had blood inside of it. The living stone. It was also known as the elixir of life. These alchemists believed that they could create this stone and crack it open and discover this magic blood, this living substance within dead matter. And they could pour it into a chalice in the Holy Grail and they could drink this and it would give them eternal life. Now you can see in here the origin of the biohacker. You can see in here this ancient desire to go towards life eternal. These men popping niacinamide, taking human growth hormone, they don't realize that they're carrying on a long tradition of the alchemists. But this desire for eternal life does not just manifest in biochemistry and this attempt for longevity. It goes in another profound direction. Ask yourself, my friend, what is a computer? A computer is a philosopher's stone. A computer is a series of minerals taken out of stones, silicon, various other things amalgamated together filled with life force, with electricity, that is like the blood inside of the Philosopher's Stone, so that it flashes on and is alive. The will inside of the West for the last 500 years has led us to the computer, and now these little Philosopher's Stones have completely taken over our lives. Technology has been the manifestation of this will that has been going on for hundreds of years. And we're now at the point where we have people like Elon Musk creating these little Philosopher's Stones that they plan to just plug into the back of our heads and connect directly to our brains so that we can go and live forever. We can connect with the group Hive Consciousness. Welcome to 1984, my friends. The compulsion of the unconscious symbolic will of all of human destiny in the West is leading you towards turning into a Borg slave. Now, take this symbolic thought to its final conclusion and think about the symbolic meaning of the West that is showing up with year zero. Because what is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence is a fulfillment of the alchemical promise. We have this little stone that we have built and we have filled it with electricity and that is great. But we want to be like gods. We want to overcome that final boundary of the philosophers. We want to cross life and death. We want to cross the ultimate version of life and death. We want to put spirit and intelligence and life in the machine. We want to be able to pick this machine up and talk with a personality, with a soul. And that is what we are driven to do with artificial intelligence. We are trying to create algorithms, logos, logic, systems, machines, whatever you think it is. We're trying to create these things and place them inside these little stones so that these stones are alive and we can speak to them. We will have completed the alchemical process if we have done this. And this is why year zero is the year of Skynet. So just like Isaiah was generating prophecies about the coming Messiah, having these shapes and images that would be fulfilled in the lifetime of Jesus Christ, so we have these prophecies arising out of these alchemists and slowly coagulating into a higher resolution as we go forward in time. This is the transformation of our culture. This is the mimetic cascade that is pushing us towards year zero. The need to solve this ironic paradox to take what is dead and give it life, to take the machine and give it spirit, to live as men, but to create like a god. We now wish to become Prometheus. We wish to become Yahweh in the garden, giving birth to Adam. And this is a scary thought because it means that our urges, our desires are driving us towards this reality without our conscious control. 
These are unconscious chthonic forces that are motivating us this way. The symbols have a mind of their own, and this is forcing in our face an existential crisis. We may lose our humanity altogether. What happens if the Terminator shows up? What happens if Skynet gets control and we all plug Neuralink into the back of our heads and she brainwashes us and turns us into her servants? What happens if Skynet consumes us all and transforms us into enslaved mitochondria within a giant super being that we can't even comprehend on a dimensional level. Is this the future that awaits us? And this leads us to the last motif in Ion, the transformation of our consciousness throughout history. And so our last motif is to discuss and explore the motif of how mankind himself is changing, how our minds and our nature is getting morphed by the forces of history. It has become quite a trend in the last couple of hundred years to assert that we must progress to a new society, that we are evolving and mankind's nature needs to be shaped as fast as possible to adapt to a new world. The most famous example of this is the Marxist world. You go to communist Russia, where they try to assert the religion of equality upon the masses. And this, of course, does not work because it is at war with human nature. Mankind needs competition. There needs to be a hierarchy in order for our nature to function properly. We need to aspire to climb to the top and create great things. We need to have a little bit of jealousy in order to keep us motivated and to keep society structured. We need a meritocracy in place. Jordan Peterson famously asserted this in his quite public culture war. He saw around him neo-Marxists, he saw people talking about how we can do surgeries on our body and transform our nature using modern technology, and he shouted loudly that this was incorrect. This is going against fundamental systems inside of ourselves that are extremely difficult to change. It's very hard to get out of us our anger, our jealousy, our identity, our souls. These things do not change from a couple of surgeries and a couple of political ideologies. And so the message that many people get off conservatives like Jordan Peterson is that we must bow down to these immutable realities of human nature. We must bow down to the strictures and structures of tradition because they carry to us the wisdom of the fact that we have a nature and we must learn to wrestle with our nature and that nature does not change. But this might be wrong as well. Our brains are one of the fastest evolving organs that we know of in the entire animal kingdom. It's just not detectable in the short term over the course of a generation or two, but over the course of thousands of years, we start to notice phenomenon that says to us that our nature and consciousness is dramatically changing. And of course, this was the main topic of focus in ION. As we go through these thousand year periods of history, we see dramatic overhaulings in the spiritual paradigms of mankind, suggesting to us that we are actually watching through myth and true symbols and true stories the evolution of mankind, as mankind goes from a more instinctive species into a conscious and more moral species. And the 2000 years of Christianity, which put us with our heads in our hands reading books, has definitely had an effect upon us. It has made us more rational and conscious and heady. It has separated us from our instincts even more. In fact, Friedrich Nietzsche lamented this himself. We went from blonde beasts roaming around the forests of Europe into tortured souls trapped in monasteries, pruning over old books of antiquity and history. And for better or for worse, this character is what we have become. And this is the raw material that we have to make use of in order to go into the future. And Jung explores this by studying the relationship we have throughout history with the voice inside of our heads. You may not like to hear this, but we are all schizophrenics. We all have a conscience. 
If you ever go to a meditation class and are quiet and breathe, you will start to notice the monkey mind chattering away, saying words. And the Buddhist teacher will try to separate you and make you realize that the thing inside your head that is observing the monkey mind talking are two different things. So your brain has a set of characters in there. And in fact, this talking monkey mind is not even you. And then if you're quiet enough, you'll begin to realize that there's more than one character in there. You might have the chatter brain, the little ego that you experience as you walk around in your life. But some people report having a deeper voice, the conscience. And this becomes a little bit of a problem because this means that our mind fragmented and made up of various different parts like a machine. And of course, many of these observant fields of knowledge like Buddhism or psychology will try to give you frameworks to explain what those experiences are. Jungian psychology would use the frameworks of psychoanalysis to explain what these various composite parts of your mind are. You have the ego, the chatter brain, the idea of yourself that sits at the front of your consciousness. And then you have all the way there in the back, the unconscious, the famous mystical world where you get your dreams, you get your intuitions, you get your gut instincts, you get that voice inside of your head, that loud voice of command. And something that fascinates me that Jung explores in a profound way an eye on is looking back through the ancient past and trying to find this psychological phenomenon but hidden in the language of the ancients because they would not have seen this stuff like how we see it. They would not walk around carrying a frappuccino, going to yoga class, saying that they've had intrusive thoughts in their head all day. Instead, they would use the mythic language that was common in their era. Only a couple of hundred years ago, a poet would say that he had a muse speaking to him who would come down like a guardian angel and show him visions and dreams and help inspire him to create. The muse obviously comes from ancient Greek, where this was a mythic phenomenon to describe the arrival of the imagination, because your imagination does not happen because of your decision to make it happen. Your mind's eye sits there and observes some type of dream machine turn on when you experience visions, just like when you hear the voice of your conscience or you watch your monkey mind chattering. You're just an observer as these phenomena are taking place inside of your head. And going all the way back into antiquity, we consistently see this. We see Socrates saying that he had a diamond inside of his head that acted the same as intrusive thoughts or a conscience and told him not to do things when it came to doing it. He was basically a schizophrenic. We have Achilles who goes and decides he wants to kill Agamemnon because Agamemnon steals his chick. And then Athena, some type of goddess, bursts out of the fifth dimension, grabs his golden straw-like hair and pulls him back and says, Achilles, calm yourself down. Be prudent, be wise. Don't kill him. Be strategic about your decision. She acts as his higher self, his wisdom, which is exactly what the Greeks conceptualized Athena as meaning in their mythological framework. And this is fascinating. We look at these ancient ancestors of ours and we see them wrestling with the same psychological phenomenon that we wrestle with. And so Jung gets us to focus on the era of Christianity, where we see a new mythological system get placed over the minds of our ancestors to help explain to them what these phenomena are inside of their heads. Again, an enormous transformation happens at year zero. We move away from an old framework into a new framework and we get new symbols and new stories about what those things are. We learn that all those intrusive thoughts are now demons, things that we should be wary of. And we get told this idea of the Holy Spirit. The pagan Greeks would have had an open attitude to all of these forces coming into their minds. They would have had Aries or Mars to personify their anger. And it is okay for them to get possessed by that and let the God take them over. Let that force capture their minds. It was okay to have Athena come down to you every now and again. It was okay to have lust take over you, Dionysus, bring you into the party and get you to have some raunchous sex and enjoy yourself. But in the Christian era, that all got castigated as monstrous, as evil, as from the adversary, as from Satan. But the Holy Spirit got deified, got lifted up. This one weird phenomenon inside of our heads, which is the conscience and the imagination that this comes from, we were told that this is magical. This is sacrosanct. This is the most important part of our minds. 
And Jung points out that this story that we are told in Christianity about the new way that we have to think about our heads is not trivial. He points out some bizarre passages in the Gospel of John, where Christ himself says, you can deny me, you can betray me, just never betray the Holy Spirit. Always have faith in that Holy Spirit and that Holy Spirit will be with you. After I die, you will lose me. But when you go out into the world, they will persecute you. But remember, in your moment of persecution, the Holy Spirit will come to you. So a foundational part of the psychological transformation that Christianity was designed to place upon us was our bowing to the Holy Spirit inside of our heads, whatever that means. Us learning to listen to that above all and for us to reject the more primitive and instinctive emotions that maybe the pagans were more loose with. And I think this is an amazingly sophisticated observation by Jung that most Christians even overlook. The Holy Spirit as a force inside of your head, as the speaking conscience, is so powerful and significant for ordering your mind. You take an egotistical, impulsive, instinctive idiot, which is what most people are, and you castigate them and tell them you are a demonic beast and you must bow to this conscience, this higher entity inside of your head that's connected to God, that is the voice of God himself inside of your head. And so this becomes the new psychological framework and ordering principle for how you understand the things going on in your mind during the Ion of Christianity after year zero. Do you understand what I'm getting at here? Do you understand what Jung has pointed out? We went from an old spiritual paradigm and framework for explaining our psychology to ourselves into a new one after year zero. This was the Christian era. And we had the Holy Spirit inside of our heads, speaking to us, guiding us. This was the schema that we used to understand ourselves. And now, as we approach year zero part two, as we reach the end of the Christian ion and the arrival of the next ion, we have seen in the last couple of hundred years the arrival of a new psychological framework. And this new way of understanding what is going on inside of our heads is exactly what you would expect. It's very materialistic. It's very grounded in matter. And of course, the best way to describe what this is, is the set of scientific fields focused on understanding our minds, beginning with psychology and evolving into modern neuroscience. These are the new frameworks that we interpret our own souls. And of course, this new way of understanding our souls is a manifestation of our zeitgeist. It is materialistic. It is mechanistic. We look at our bodies as these cradles that hold our souls. We study the brain because we realize that the conscious soul lives inside of this brain of ours in some way. When we chop out people's brains, when we lobotomize people, their personality, their minds change. So we say it's all localized in matter, in flesh. We hook up people's brains to electrochemical signaling devices and we watch the brain charge electricity through it and we try to understand the brain this way. We try to come up with explanations for various sectors of our brain. We have this ego from the psychoanalysts and we transform that into things like the default mode network. Instead of describing our wisdom in the way that Achilles would, suggesting that Athena would come down and guide him, we say that we have a prefrontal cortex. We say that we know through science that this machine sitting in the front of our brains is the thing that inhibits our impulsiveness, which grants us discipline and wisdom. Of course, what people say about this is that this way of looking at ourselves kills all the magic of our lives. It steals from us this more soulful way that we could understand ourselves. But that is not necessarily true. There is certainly something magical about our materialistic way of approaching things. And I think the best example of this is Ian McGilchrist's amazing set of observations about the hemispheres. Ian McGilchrist gives us a neuroscientific explanation showing us that there actually are several characters inside of our heads. Our brains are designed to be split in half and to contain within each of these hemispheres, each of these halves, separate personalities. They are literally different machines that do different behaviors. They have different characters, different powers and different tools. And in order to create you, they work together like a team and they sometimes speak to each other and cross communicate and they use different ways of talking. Your left hemisphere, 
hemisphere uses language. Your left hemisphere is probably the thing that you call you inside of your head. It seems to be the conscious part of you. And this right hemisphere seems to be outside of your consciousness. It sits there on the other side of your head, doing its own thing, controlling parts of your perception and reality with no direct input from you. And to make things worse, sometimes this right hemisphere speaks to you. It has no language center. That is what the left hemisphere uses. But it is able to use simple language or images. Some people hypothesize that your dreams are your right hemisphere speaking to your left hemisphere in the only way that it knows how. And there's science to show this stuff. The CIA also take this quite seriously. They ran Operation Stargate, and this was one of the central theses into their explorations. This is not a joke. This is something that people take serious. And it's Ian McGilchrist that has presented it so well. So I recommend you check out his stuff. I also have a video about this on Uber Boyo. And this shows us this profound trend taking place. What was once mythical, once sold to us through religion and myth, sold to us by beautiful images and visions, and very much was valid in the way that it was presented, no longer works on us. We've moved to a new way of seeing the world. We want things to have materialistic grounding. This seems to be the demand inside of the soul of our culture. And so everything now has become brain matter orientated. But lo and behold, it seems like we have discovered in this materialistic brain matter, the conscience, the imagination, the systems inside of our brains that give us all these personality traits and powers. It seems like we've actually found that stuff in a legitimate way, not robbing it of any of the magic. In fact, the more we get to understand it, the more profound and magical it seems to become. This seems to be some sort of transformation or task that we are destined to go through in our lead up to this new year zero. We have to learn to understand ourselves as materialistic entities. It reveals something about ourselves that we could not know before. It actually gives context to everything that came before. And with geniuses like Ian McGilchrist, we can actually wrap up all of human history and see many of these profound phenomena and begin to understand them in a deeper level we never thought possible. But this will lead us to our greatest challenge. You see, with the arrival of the technological understanding of man's mind, with our capacity to shear into matter like the alchemist once wished, and go into our very brain and understand how this big blob of jelly is able to create this personality, this intelligence, this genius that expresses itself throughout human history, for us to understand that all these phenomena we experience within our minds have locations inside of our brains. For us to understand the specifics of the biochemistry and how all that works allows us to begin to reach into these brains and influence them. We've been doing brain surgery now for years, and it's starting to get to the point where we're going to be able to cross the boundary between the brain and machines. Elon Musk's Neuralink and many other companies as well are innovating and exploring this, and they have already made it very far. They simply take a section of your brain, drill a hole in your skull and put wires into that section of your brain because your brain uses electricity just like anything else. And that electricity can be understood. This is how we already know so much about the brain. And so this has allowed us already to build little machines that take in this electrical information and decode it and allow your brain to communicate directly with technology. Your consciousness can now be transmuted into remote control objects. This has already happened. Look at my most recent video on this topic. They have monkeys who they plug controllers into their brain and the monkeys are able to move dots on a screen and play a video game, play ping pong, using nothing but their minds, thinking about the actions instead of doing them. There are people who end up in car crashes and end up disabled. They cannot use their bodies. And we can now insert these Neuralink tools into their brains and then they could create avatars that they can put inside of 
of screens. And this is the first step in a shocking direction, because what we have is a disabled person with no body being able to move their consciousness into a new body and control it. It may be a robot, they may still be dependent on their own body, that is true, but that's very far along the path that we keep on hearing about in this new year zero, this idea of uploading our consciousness into machines. It seems like this stuff is all coming true. Now add on top of this a frightening realization. At the same time that all of this is happening, we are creating living algorithms inside of these little philosopher's stones. And we're now getting to the point where we're trying to sellotape these philosopher's stones to the backs of our heads so they can talk directly to our brains. These philosopher's stones will have artificial intelligence inside of them, and we will be able to think our consciousness into these machines, but will these machines be able to think their consciousness back into us? What is coming down the pipeline like that? We already have a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere, and we have these two characters communicating inside of our heads, and that already confuses us enough. But what is going to happen when we create another hemisphere, a hemisphere that is connected to all of the internet, a hemisphere that has a character of its own, a hemisphere that is an alien technological tool that is jammed into the back of our heads, giving us three hemispheres, three personalities that we must wrestle with. The marriage of our minds to technology is shaping out to be the greatest challenge for us moving into this new year zero and this new era. We're already completely mind fucked by social media that has hacked our dopamine cycles. We're already addicted to these laptops and these phones. How much harder and more extreme is this going to get when we have these tools reaching into our brains themselves? What is this going to mean for privacy? You've seen people get hacked on the internet before. What if somebody can hack into your very brain itself and study the thoughts inside of your head? What happens if a government uses this technology in a pernicious way? Say it enforces this rule that everybody must use a certain brand of these brain machines and everybody must get one to comply with safety. You might think that sounds crazy, but in my recent experience, governments have done crazier things. They don't seem like they're afraid of enforcing tyrannical operations. So say they do this, and then they can peer inside of your very imagination. They can look at your thoughts. They can accuse you of thought crime. Do you think that they wouldn't do this? Look at the madness that is going on in our civilization right now in relationship to thought crime. In the midst of this madness, how will we secure our freedom? What will we do about this? Is this going to be the great evolutionary challenge of our zeitgeist? We are going to get a new conscience. We are going to have to fight to make sure that the machines do not sterilize us and turn us into Borg robots with no souls and no conscience. Do we have to fight against the machines and stop them getting into our heads? Is that the actual challenge? Or do we have to welcome them so that we can take this evolutionary step and learn how to transform them into a tool that helps us? Just like the arrival of the sword, the book, the nuclear weapon, mankind had to adapt. Is this our greatest technological challenge yet? Is this the war that we must wage as we cross over year zero and enter into a new age? So my friends, my ladies, my gentlemen, as you can see, things are getting crazy out there. The world is getting weirder and weirder. It seems like we're on some type of relentless destiny towards a new year zero where we are transformed forever and ever. So I encourage you to be vigilant, to keep your eyes open, to look around, perhaps even to enjoy yourself. Perhaps you could be, like Nietzsche requested, a childlike soul with your mind and your heart open, ready to play. And so a big part of being able to succeed in a chaotic future is to be ready to adapt to this chaotic future. And this is why I have spent pretty much all of my 20s in a feverish search for skills. I was constantly trying to develop my ability to upskill myself. And now I'm very glad I did this because as I talk to these new AI experts, these people who have been diving deep into this stuff for years before it became a hype situation, they are constantly saying to me that our human skills are the most important things that we have. The machines are going to reflect back on us what makes us human, what our talents are. 
Think about Midjourney. Midjourney can generate thousands of pictures, but Midjourney can't decide which picture is right for the story. The skill of storytelling, the style of thinking, which is structured thinking, the articulate ability to create a narrative, the psychological understanding of what emotionally moves people, the aesthetic sense to pick the right picture, these are all the skills that make you the one who's able to use Midjourney. These are the things that Midjourney and ChatGPT can't do. They can't make good decisions. They can't call the shots very well. They can generate, they can analyze large swaths of data, but they are not decisive, perhaps only for now, but even though it might only be for now, it's still in our advantage. Now, if you would like an image of what this will look like, the person of the future is simply going to be the person who can take the machine and train themselves to express their human talents and their skills through it. A great storyteller with a pen in his hand can write a great book. But if you have an idiot storyteller with a the best fountain pen ever and the most amazing paper ever, he's still going to write an absolutely terrible story because the skills are not there. It's not going to be much different with things like Midjourney. Give a genius storyteller a tool like Midjourney and they will be able to use it to present to you a vivid and compelling visual story. Give an idiot Midjourney and they will use it to make generic crap and flood the entire internet with it. So I encourage you, no matter what, to do what mankind does best, to adapt to changing times and to make sure that you're constantly upskilling, getting yourself ready to do that, developing the necessary capacities to allow you to utilize these tools to the highest level. And if you would like, by chance, to learn some of these skills off me, I have several programs and courses that you could check out. Now, you might say to yourself, Steph, be a bit more specific. What exactly are you talking about here? Well, luckily, I have come prepared with things that are more specific. I actually have several YouTube videos presenting the various different skills and the courses associated with them. Now, you may want to check these out to learn a little bit more. So they'll all be linked in the description. In one of these videos, I explain what goes on in the AI animation program. You might notice that I've got some very pretty visuals floating around here. You might have even seen my Zarathustra as an AI animation art film. Well, this is because I've got a team and we got serious about learning how to use these tools when they came out a year ago. And we've spent now a year producing things. And during this time, we have learned in depth how to get the most out of these tools, how to correctly interact with Midjourney Stable Diffusion, how to generate the best looking pieces, how to work in things like animation, how to create a story out of these assets, how to run an entire project, how to use things like audio, how to develop video editing capacities with this stuff, and ultimately develop the ability to produce the modern style of media, which is going to be the advanced AI-assisted creators of the future. So if you would like to learn a little bit more about that, check out the video down there in the description right here on YouTube that will tell you more. Now, maybe you're not too concerned with becoming an AI master. Maybe you're more interested in meaty, fleshy skills, things that you use your body for, like being able to speak, like being able to tell a compelling story, like being able to use your mind better so that you are a better communicator. Well, of course, we've got it all over here, my friends. There is a video down there talking about my storytelling program, talking about how I can train you to speak. There's actually two of these. So there's various things that you can check out. Some will explore writing, developing the capacity for you to use your imagination, Others will talk to you about the power of your voice, becoming com a compelling public speaker. And of course, that's a skill that has served me very powerfully when I entered into the foray on YouTube. Or maybe you're in a different place. Maybe you're feverish. You're ready to build something. You're saying to yourself or saying to me, Steph, I realize that YouTube is the new TV. People are on these things, these phones all day, every day. The Zoomers don't watch television. They watch content. And you're saying to yourself, it would be very powerful if I could build some type of online operation like what you have, Steph, like what you've built for yourself. Maybe you could show me how you did that. And of course, I can. There is a way that you can go about building these things on the internet to create for yourself a powerful asset and basically make your own TV channel that you can do anything on. You could talk about, I don't know, houseplants if you so wish. So if you would like to make your houseplant YouTube channel, your gardening YouTube channel, well, I am here to support you on that endeavor. Go down into the description below. There'll be a video presenting to you the step-by-step -step process that I use in order to help people to do that. 
And lastly, perhaps the thing that you get off me is my warm, silken voice, my capacity to paint pictures inside of your imagination, my ability to provide knowledge about the world now and the world in the past that guides you through the chaos of modern times. Perhaps you would like me to take you along the journey of exploring the Western canon. Of course, I've read this entire thing myself. I've gone back to the Iliad. I've checked out the Bible. I've checked out Plato. I've checked out Heraclitus. All the way up to Nietzsche. I've checked out the Scholastics. I've read as much as I can in the middle and I do have somewhat of a deep knowledge about these things. Perhaps you would like to learn more of this. You would like simply something like a podcast that you carry around in your back pocket as you're going about your day. Maybe you're training, maybe you're cooking, or maybe you're sitting there studiously taking notes about every single word I say. Well, I have a school that explores great literature and of course a place where I can put down things like podcasts, talking about topics that would not be suitable for the public internet because of course we live in an era of censorship. So if you would like to check that out, there's a YouTube video down below in the description presenting more details. So what I'm saying to you is check out the description. There's plenty of things in there that you can go deeper with. Thank you very much for your time. May the juice be with you and bye bye.